Well, our scripture this morning is found in John chapter 7, beginning at verse 53. We're going to look at the very end of 7, and, and then we'll look at the first of 11 verses, I guess, here in, in John chapter 8. Verse 53 says, everyone went to his own home. So everybody went home. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he came again into the temple, and all the people were coming to him, and he sat down, and he began to teach them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery, and having set her in the center of the court, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in adultery in the very act. Now in the law... Moses commanded us to stone such women, such women as this. What then do you say? They were saying this, testing him, so that they might have grounds for accusing him. But Jesus stooped down with his finger, wrote in the, on the ground. But when they persisted in asking him, he straightened up and he said to them, he who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. When they heard it, they began to go out one by one, beginning with the older ones, and he was left alone, and the woman where she was in the center of the court. Straightening up, Jesus said to her, Woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. Go from now on. Sin no more. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for your word. Lord, that you don't ignore difficult problems, difficult issues, Lord, but that you speak directly to them, Lord, and you reveal to us the truth of your word. Father, as we examine our lives this morning and, and notice the sins that are still there, Lord. Convict us, Lord, challenge us to put those aside, to repent, Lord, and to go and sin no more. Father, give us courage, Lord, give us strength. Lord, help us to share the good news with others about the amazing grace of Jesus Christ. We pray and ask in Jesus' name, amen. Well, I've, I've mentioned before, probably on several occasions, about the fascinating story of the French acrobat London, whose spectacular feats back in the mid-1800s captured global attention. I mean, he would have been on Facebook, he would have been tweeted about everything. Uh, we would have heard a lot about London. In August of 1860, he crossed Niagara Falls on a tightrope 1,100 feet long, strung 160 feet above the water. Now it's high enough just to be right on the edge of the falls, but above the water that high, I just can't imagine. And so he began and, and pushed a wheelbarrow across this wire to, to start with. And then ignoring the protests from the Prince of Wales, he carried his agent on his back all the way across and back again. And then he turned to the crowd and he asked, Do you believe that I can do that with you? Of course, responded one man. I've just seen you do it. Well, hop on, he said, or hop in the wheelbarrow. I'll take you across. Well, the man who said he believed he could do it had no intention of following through on that affirmation, of course. The crowd had a good laugh from a display of words with no faith. Actually, the man had faith, but faith alone doesn't save anybody. As has already been explained in the book of John in chapters 2 and 6, in our text this morning, the continuing discussion between Jesus and his Jewish accusers offers a contrast of truth and error, light and darkness, freedom and slavery, False discipleship and true discipleship. The, the word truth appears nine times in chapter 8. Truth. 
clearly a key word of the passage. Truth. But here in our, our portion of the text, we encounter the narrative on the adulterous woman over which Bible scholars have argued about this for years. Its placement at the beginning of chapter 8 serves as a foundation for the rest of the chapter. And as we've seen, uh, John 7, 53 through 8, 11 records the beautiful story of this woman caught in adultery that illustrates the central dilemma of salvation. How justice and mercy can be harmonized. How in the world can you harmonize the just, holy nature of God? with His mercy, without encouraging sin, or without condemning sinners. Truly, we're becoming a shameless society today. Can we say that? That's right. Does art attempt to depict true life? Or do we attempt to make our lives better and, and correspond to the artist's conceptions of life? Televisions, Television stories, movies, do those depict real life? I would say they caricature life. They distort life. We see adultery. We see murder, crime, sin. If you just sum it all up as sin. But we don't see it as God sees it. We tend to accept these things, you know, it's just a part of life. Let's examine this incident of sin that Jesus was confronted with and see if we can begin to understand the significance of sin. And then we'll be able to truly understand the amazing grace that He offers us. First, we'll look at how Jesus dealt with these men. And second, we'll look at some methods of dealing with sin. The shameful disturbance begins... We know Jesus had spent the night on the Mount of Olives, and now it's early in the morning, and he's teaching these eager followers, these eager learners. Who would have imagined? Who could have imagined this disturbance out of the, you know, out of nothing? They're just sitting there. He's sitting there teaching, and now all of a sudden, they throw this woman into the square. Imagine the discussion that took place. Before they brought her there. You know? Well, we can go get Susie. And we'll bring her to Jesus. And we all know what Susie is. Right? And so the scribes and the Pharisees. Trying to end Jesus' ministry. Found. Found. A woman caught. In adultery. A woman who could be used to entrap Jesus and catch him. And then, rudely and without apology, they just burst in upon this holy Sunday school class, if you will. Can you imagine being in church and then talk about indecent exposure? Somebody brings in a prostitute. I'm sure there would have been some rude language. Certainly embarrassment. You know, how offensive would that have been? It's, it's difficult to imagine what brought these religious leaders to the place of stooping so low just to get some statement from Jesus that could damage his ministry, just to try to back him into some corner where he couldn't escape. Why did they bring her to Jesus? They had courts for these matters. She could have been taken there. Also, anyone with an ounce of decency would have taken the matter to Jesus in private. Their hatred, though, drove them to this unspeakable, let's do this in public, behavior. What did they tell Jesus there in verse 4? Teacher, this woman has been caught, what? In adultery, in the very act. You know, in the middle of that, I, I asked the question, well, where's the guy? Where's the man? Have you already stoned him? I don't know. Also, you know, in the back of my mind is, 
was one of these guys bringing her one, you know, the guy. What a brutal indelicacy this was. Why did they bring her to Jesus? Well, their plan, they want to catch him, they want to set this trap for him. If he upheld Mosaic law, then he would violate Roman law. And if he denied Mosaic law, he would confuse his followers. Let me ask us today, do we drag the sins of other people out in public? Discuss them, you know, are we as uncaring and unsensitive as uh, insensitive as these men are? What about the things we talk about with other people? Are we guilty of the sin of gossip? Oh, it's about somebody else, you know, we can talk about. No, it's gossip. Why do we point out the sins of others? Well, it makes us feel better, doesn't it? We avoid examining our own condition before God when we're busy pointing out the obvious sins of other people. Jesus knew they weren't interested in the woman's sin. They were only interested in setting their trap for him. His response immediately, his immediate response was he just squatted down and started writing in the dust. What did he write? Words, sentences. A 10th century manuscript reads, wrote on the ground the sins of each one of them. I think that's reasonable. I've speculated before he started writing the Roman numeral one, two, three. Maybe at the foot of each one, he wrote down the Roman numeral of the sin that that person was guilty of. <coughs> you know, at least in their direction. I don't know. We don't know what he wrote. But I think it was something significant that caused them to understand their sin. Look at what he said. But when... They persisted in asking him. He straightened up and he said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. So he turns it on them. They don't realize that they've actually set a trap for themselves. And Jesus says, Okay. You holier than thou people. The one without any sin gets to throw the first stone. His point is loud and clear. The, the point in the word sinless prick the open sores of sinfulness in the lives of these men. You know, I wondered if he didn't write the day and time that each one had an appointment with this lady on the ground. I don't know. But you would wonder. How did these scribes and Pharisees know where to find such a, a woman? How did they even know about it? If they were really holy people, they wouldn't even know where to go look for such a person, would they? Somehow they knew. Maybe as they stood there before an object of lust, their sins were just too obvious to them. I don't know. But his response, Jesus' response to us when we gossip, when we bring sins of other people out in the open, is found in Matthew 7, 1 through 5. He says, do not judge so that you will not be judged. For in the way you judge, you will be judged. And by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck that's in your brother's eye and did not notice the log that's sticking out of your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye and behold, the log is in your own eye? <laughs> you hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. 
And then verse 9 here says, when they heard it, they began to go out one by one. Beginning with the older ones, age should account for some wisdom, after all, right? And then the younger ones who still wanted to throw the rock realized, well, okay, I guess I can't either. And they dropped the rock and followed the others away. It says, and he was left alone, and the woman where she was in the center of the court. So Jesus turned this situation from a legal quibble to a moral issue and placed the matter on their consciences. He silenced them, convicted them, and condemned his enemies. How could they respond when they were too guilty of sin to follow through with their plan. And as I mentioned, perhaps sin in this very incident. Without a word, they recognized the thrust of what Jesus had said and they were defeated. Do we understand as Paul attempted to tell us in Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There's not one righteous person in this room. It's where we all stand. We too are defeated by sin. And that brings us to looking at the various methods of dealing with sin. First, consider the clouded way of sinners. The sinner delights in his own way of judging and condemning. It's, it's terrible for a sinner to fall into the hands of sinners. <laughs> These men were so blinded that their own faults weren't visible. They were keen to detect the faults of someone else. And, and as a result, they were sharp, they were cruel, they were unfair, they were godless in their methods. Someone like this woman had no chance. They hid behind their robes of religious respectability, or perhaps they enjoyed the misery of their victim, I don't know. They had no desire for reform or repentance or an amended life. Second is the callous method of the law. It's been said this method is as bad as the first. Moses said, such should be stoned. A woman like this, you should stone. The law used a strong right arm in dealing with sin. It was instantaneous. It was powerful. No mercy. This woman was confronted with a law that was cruel, hard, merciless. She couldn't escape the power of the legal demands. The, the prescription called for arrest, condemnation, scourging, and stones. No attempt was made to reclaim, to save, or to give life. The, the cold, calculating demands of the law condemns every one of us, however. If we were tried by the law, we would end the same way. Then finally, fortunately, we have the compassion of Jesus. A description of Jesus' method would be mercy, hope, forgiveness, and life. Jesus hates sin. Don't be confused here. Jesus hates sin. Jesus does not condone sin. Our scripture points this out by Jesus rebuking the accusers by what he said to the woman as well. Uh, he dealt with her tenderly and respectfully and actually used the same word that he used when addressing his mother. Did he treat her too leniently? leniently? A lot of people have argued that. He's way too lenient with this. But Jesus came to condemn sin 
and not sinners. He came to save the sinners. He came to forgive and save and not make light of sin. You know, he never did that. He never made light of sin. He extended to her, though, the opportunity of salvation. He offered her a new life free from sin, a new power to cope with the tempter and to live victorious. In Romans, Paul has said, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. To this woman who had been living a life of disgrace, Jesus offered her this amazing grace. With the accusers gone, now there's no condemnation against her. The Son of God refused to press the issue. Her, her sin wasn't just set aside, though. Soon Jesus would pay the penalty for both this woman and her accusers. He would pay for both of their sins. But his instruction was plain and direct. From now on, what? <coughs> sin no more. Stop sinning. James Boyce tells the story of a man who sat in his office aware of, of the deep sin in his life, but un unable to do anything about it. And, and Boyce helped him by, by using the illustration of a man walking along the street and all of a sudden he was splashed by a car in the dark. As he continued, he came into the light of a street lamp and he became aware of the stains on his clothing. Finally, the man decided that he, he couldn't go on the way he was now. So he turned around and went home to put on clean clothes. And at that point, the young man in Boyce's office responded by saying, my problem is that I don't have any clean clothes. Precisely was the answer. Our text tells us about this woman who also did not have clean clothes. And about Pharisees who also did not have on clean clothes. The thing is, she knew she didn't. But they thought they did. Jesus offered the clean clothes of forgiveness to all of them. And he offers it to us as well. Jesus asked a rhetorical question. Woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? And the woman answered it quite simply. No one more. <clears throat> Forgiveness rests upon the Lord's understanding. And in, in this encounter with Jesus, we find recognition of the sin. We find repentance. We find regeneration and restitution and reconciliation. A second important lesson here is that forgiveness rests upon the Lord's grace. This amazing, amazing grace. Remember the parable of the, of the prodigal son in Luke 15? Seems to me that it's become more and more on my mind in, in these days. The father showed unconditional forgiveness and restoration when his son returned. Salvation doesn't come from our suffering. It comes from God's grace. From the suffering and death of Jesus on our behalf. We'll be speaking about it more in the future. Finally this morning. We see that the verdict rests upon the Lord's forgiveness. Forgiveness demands a clean break with sin. Demands confession and repentance. Matthew 9 2, we read, And they brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralytic, Take courage, son. Your sins are forgiven. In searching for a way to translate, this, this verse, a missionary linguist working among the Guajira tribe in Colombia translated the Lord's words, I forgive you, let's be friends again. This is the same kind of forgiveness that Jesus is offering to us today, to, to sinners whose sins equal that of this woman, or, or those of the Pharisees even. And not only forgiveness for initial salvation, but also for the daily continual sins 
of anger and disobedience and envy and greed and the judgmental character we see exemplified by these Pharisees which gave birth to the whole story. I'll close with this one. Billy had been a bad man on the outside. So bad, in fact, that he was sentenced to die for his crimes. However, while he was on death row in a southern prison, Billy finally met Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior and was able to lead several other death row inmates to the Lord after his conversion. But in January of that year, Billy's execution date arrived. Now, this story was told by a volunteer chaplain who had been instrumental in leading Billy to know the Lord as his Savior. He said several people were on hand to witness the execution, including a woman who had been a key witness against Billy at his trial. This woman hated Billy, no doubt with a good reason. A closed curtain covered the window between the viewing room and the place of execution, and before the curtain was opened, the audience in the viewing room heard someone singing, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Then when the curtain opened, they realized that the, the one who had been singing that song was Billy himself. His last request had been to be able to sing that song <coughs> as a witness that his life was changed. He was a wretch, but now he was a child of God and forgiven. When he finished singing, he nodded to the executioner and went to be with the Lord. The chaplain who was also present saw that the woman who was there for the execution was so touched that she began to cry. He went to speak with her and was able to lead her also to receive Jesus as her Savior. Even in his death, Billy gave a powerful witness to his beloved Lord and Savior, who changed him from a, a terrible criminal to someone who was responsible for others meeting their Savior. Titus 2, beginning at verse 11, says this, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age. Looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. These things speak and exhort and reprove with all authority. Let no one disregard you. In this world, we've allowed the world to disregard us as believers, to disregard the message of Christ, and we need to stand firm. We need to stand boldly. And as it says, exhort and reprove with all authority. With the authority of Jesus Christ, be a witness and a testimony of the amazing grace that can change lives. We're going to sing that song, Amazing Grace. If you need to make a decision for the Lord, you can come forward, take you by the hand, say, I need Jesus as my Savior. All of us today need to commit to be that courageous witness for Christ, to not allow anyone to disregard us in our testimony for Him. Well, let's stand together and commit to the Lord as we sing.